we are good to go. So, we're going to finish up, I mean, not forever, but we're going to finish up applications today. The section that we're in and have been in for the entire week now. And we're going to look at... By the way, tell me if any of these colors are particularly hard to read. We're going to look at position and velocity and acceleration. And this is sort of a classic example. I personally sometimes felt it was a little banal, but it does give a very concrete application of both the first and the second derivative. So for that reason, it always gets put into these calculus textbooks. Let's say, let's say that we have an object moving along a line. And yes? will now proceed. Um, so say that we have an object moving along a line, along specifically a number line. And this line can be oriented however we want. We could be pushing an object up a ramp and have a diagonal line, or we could be moving the object horizontally, or we could be moving horizontally and have a horizontal line, or an object could be rising or falling and have a vertical line. The material is the same, however, the line is oriented. But this line is a number line. So, however, it's oriented. We have a zero and a negative one, and we have all of the numbers on the number line. And we're going to give a name to our position on this number line. We're going to call it S of T. This is traditional. The S is from German. Don't expect me to say the German word because I can but it's um, called S abstract or something like that. It's called S of T, sort of out of tradition. It stands for something in German. And if something's moving along a line, we can meaningfully ask how quickly is the object moving along the line? We can ask for the velocity of the object. And before we do anything involving calculus, 
Let me remind you that velocity is a sign. What I mean by that is we've got this number line and we're moving along it. We could be moving to the right in the positive direction. It's right the way I have it drawn, but the positive direction is the key here. So even if our number line was on some weird diagonal, we still have a positive direction and a negative direction. And if we're moving in the positive direction, the velocity is positive. And if we're moving in the negative direction, the velocity is negative. So with that observation out of the way, we have a quick calculus equality to relate to velocity and position. The velocity is the derivative of the position. So let's try to think this through. Um, remember that the derivative is the rate of change. So as the object is moving, its position is changing. And if it's moving slowly, its velocity is low. And if it's moving quickly, if it's changing quickly, its velocity is high. So the reason the velocity is the derivative of the position is that it's measuring literally how quickly the position is changing as time passes. By the way, I've said that the velocity is, can be positive, can be negative. Maybe we don't really care about that. Like if we're talking about a car crash on a highway, we might ask how fast the cars were going, but we wouldn't really talk about one of them moving with a negative velocity. If you want to talk about how fast something is going, without any reference to its direction, the speed is the absolute value of the velocity, which we've now seen, is the absolute value of that derivative. And we don't have a standard letter to use for speed, unfortunately, because we've already used S for position. I mean, I guess this is really all we need to do some kind of example. Let's say, An object is launched upwards from a platform. 
So its height above the ground is already non-zero at the moment of launch. Its height above the ground will depend on how quickly it was launched up and it will depend on its initial height. It will depend on how high the platform was. That negative 4.9, by contrast, comes from um, gravity. It comes from the acceleration due to Earth's gravity. It's a physical constant. So, We've got a platform, we've got the object launching up, we've got the object launching up and falling down. And this picture can be a little deceptive. Because, I mean, you might look at this and say, well, hold on, the object was supposed to be moving along a straight line. What's this parabola thing that we have drawn here? But the answer to that question is that we're only looking at the object's height. We're not actually asking anything about that horizontal distance. As time passes, the object's height goes up and the object's height goes down. And that's the only part of this picture that we're interested in. We could ask a question. We could ask, for example, how quickly is the object moving when it hits? the ground. Well, the first thing we need to know to answer this question, we need to know several things, but perhaps premier among them, we need to know when the object hits the ground. And since this is the height of the object above the ground, you know how high this pen is, it is giving us S of T. When the object is lying on the ground, its height above the ground is zero. So the moment it hits the ground is the moment when S of T is zero. Now, in my capacity as college algebra teacher, I've had the quadratic formula sort of driven permanently into my mind. I wouldn't necessarily assume that you've committed that to memory. We could solve this graphically, for example. We could look at S of t equals negative 4.9t squared plus 10t plus 2. And we could look at this and we could ask when it hits the ground, when it hits the axis. And the answer is after 2.224 seconds, round, rounding to three decimal places.
So we figure that out somehow. The quadratic form to the a graph using your calculator's root finding feature. But once you have found this, you can now ask the question we're actually asking, which is, what's the velocity of this object at the moment it hits the ground? How fast is it moving? And to find the velocity is now a um, is now a calculus problem. So far, it's, uh, this could have been on a this could have been on a college algebra test to take a derivative. The velocity is the derivative of this. I hope we're pretty confident with these sort of basic rules by now, the two is going to come down, and negative 4.9 times two is negative 9.8. So negative 9.8t plus, 10. The derivative of 10t is 10. The derivative of 2 is 0. That just goes away. And if we now plug 2.2 to four in there. This is just a calculator problem. Let's see, this is a calculator problem. If my calculator will cooperate with me for just a moment. No, I can't share it. If I share it, the equation will go away. Well, online students aren't missing much. I'm just plugging negative 9.8 times 2.224 plus 10 into my calculator. <coughs> And I'm getting a negative 11.7952. And I was very sloppy with this problem. I haven't said anything about units. Um, but... <laughs> Oh, sorry. The units here must be that S is measured in meters and time is measured in seconds. Um, I say must because this physical constant, negative 4.9, would be different if I were measuring it in something else. So... Now that we've added the units to this problem, this is meters per second. And we notice, um, apropos of what I said earlier, the velocity is negative because when the object hits the ground, it's going down. We have our number line. 
the ground <coughs> is at zero, the positive numbers are up here, the negative numbers are down here. When the object hits the ground, it's moving in the negative direction. So the velocity ought to be negative, and we do indeed see that. Let's ask a slight, well, I don't know about slightly more interesting, but a slightly more meaty question. We'll come back to questions like this in force later in the class, but let's ask, when does the object reach its maximum height. Classic calculus problem. A lot of time calculus gets used behind the scenes in algorithms, so you don't always see it. But basically, any time you're running an algorithm that's trying to maximize or minimize something, it's performing calculus behind the scene. And we could approach this sort of very, in a very algebraic way. I mean, just like I found the root by looking at a graph. I could take a look at the graph and I could click on this vertex and I could say, okay, it reaches its height after 1.02 seconds. But let's take this as an opportunity to demonstrate some calculus, it being a calculus class and all. The object is going up, then the object is going down. When it's going up, the object has a positive velocity, a velocity that's greater than zero. When it's going down, the object has a negative velocity, a velocity that's less than zero. So at this moment, when the object reaches its maximum height, what do you reckon the velocity ought to be? Zero. zero. So since we can find the velocity function to find when the object reaches its maximum height is a matter of setting this velocity equal to zero. Negative 9.8t plus 10 equals zero. So negative 9.8t is negative 10, t is 10 divided by 9.8. Really negative 10 divided by negative 9.8, but our negative signs are canceling. And again, just typing this into the calculator. 
1.02, which is just what we saw on Desmos. And time is being measured in seconds here, 1.02 seconds. Is everyone with me so far? Any questions? Then, let's, this is going to end up being a pretty brief class, but we spent an entire week on one textbook section. I think it's not surprising that we're sort of running out of steam. I want to touch on acceleration just because acceleration gives such a concrete example of how the second derivative could show up. We start with the position function. Then we have the velocity function, which tells us how position changes over time. Well, just like the velocity tells us how the position changes, the acceleration tells us how the velocity changes. So the acceleration should be the derivative of the velocity. And the way I've written it, there aren't any second derivatives. But the velocity is itself a derivative. The velocity is the derivative of the position. So the acceleration is the derivative of the derivative. That is to say, the acceleration is the second derivative of the position. If we, let's just go back to this, we found, we've done this, let me erase the finished problem and give us a little room to talk. And now let's ask a new question. In. Let's ask, what's the acceleration of this falling object? And you might know this if you've taken chemistry here or in high school, the acceleration under Earth's gravity of a falling object is a constant. We found the first derivative, and it was negative 9.8 t plus 10. If we then take the derivative of the derivative, we get not negative 8 point something, we get negative 9.8 alone. And our units here are meters per second squared. <clears throat> um, if you were using feet and second, that would be, I think, negative 32 feet per second squared. So if that was the number you remember learning, it's because you were using different units. This actually provides a 
very unusual opportunity to give the third derivative some kind of concrete meaning. This is the only situation I've ever seen the third derivative actually show up in. The third derivative of the position function is called the jerk. So the derivative of the acceleration is the jerk. And you might not think, I mean, in your day-to-day -day life, sort of about jerk being some numerical thing that you can measure, but you probably have an intuitive idea of what it means for a car ride to be jerky. If you're constantly accelerating and decelerating. On the other hand, Falling is not a jerky process. When objects fall, they fall smoothly. And we can see that by computing the jerk in this example, because the derivative of a constant is zero. So this falling object isn't jerky at all. And I think that takes us to the end of this section. A slightly short lecture, as I said, but we also expanded this section heavily because um, so much of calculus is just spent learning formulas and stuff. I thought it was important in the first half of the course to try to get some kind of background for why we would care about any of this. I 